I'm very uh, happy to um, introduce our two wonderful speakers today to help us celebrate the seventh month of our year-long uh, 100th anniversary lecture series for Zen Chuji. Uh, the first, uh, I'll just introduce both of them and then we'll have, uh, we'll have them, each of them speak. Um, the first is Nyoze Damien Kwong. Um, Nyoze Kwong received his BA in Anthropology and Archaeology from UC Santa Cruz. He worked as a fundraiser at Stanford's Engineering Department, and in 1998, he lived and worked at Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and studied socially engaged Buddhism with Joan Halifax Roshi and Bernie Glassman Roshi of the Zen Peacekeeper Order for two and a half years. Nyoze received lay precepts in 1987 at Sonoma Mountain Zen Center, which he'll tell you in a, in a moment where he grew up. In 2009, he was ordained as a novice monk by Jokshu Kwang Roshi, his father. In 2012, he finished his formal training at AAG in Japan. He received Dharma transmission and is recognized as a Kai, uh, Kokusai Fu Kyoshi, international Zen teacher in the lineage of Shunru Suzuki Roshi. Currently, Nyoze serves as Fukujo Shoku vice abbot and is the head of practice and executive director at Sonoma Mountain Zen Center. He lives at Sonoma Mountain Zen Center with Kashin, his wife, and Ajo, their son. Soon enough, um, I'm not sure when, Nyoze can tell you perhaps, um, he will succeed his father, Jokshu Kwong Roshi, as abbot of Sonoma Mountain Zen Center. Our second speaker today is Yoko Okamura. Yoko Okamura is a, gender, a genre, genre fluid writer, director, and performer. Born in a Buddhist temple in Japan and raised in the frostbite of Minneapolis, Yoko now lives and works in Los Angeles. She is obsessed with telling rebellious stories through underrepresented perspectives and thrives in the intersection of grit and glamour. Yoko loves to bring these original visions uh, to life as writer director, but also gains tremendous joy helping to bring the creative vision of showrunners and writers to life for episodic TV. Yoko is currently in post for her directorial debut feature for Bloomhouse and Epic, the thriller titled Unseen stars Jolene Purdy and Midori Francis. Yoko sold a story pitched to Sam Raimi's uh, QB horror anthology, 50 States of Fright, and directed the episode Ball of Twine, starring Ming-Na Wen and Karen Allen. She directed an episode of the one-hour drama Good Trouble and a block of two episodes for The Bold Type. She's been a participant of numerous directing programs, including the Warner Brothers Directing Workshop, Ryan Murphy Half, Half Initiative, and the Fox Directing Program. And we were just talking that she's also been involved in directing a number of short films for Soto Shoe Headquarters in North America. Yoko has a BFA in film video from CalArts and an MFA in film directing from the American Film Institute. So what we'll do now is we'll have uh, Nyoze-san talk about growing up Zen uh, in his life for the first half an hour, 35 minutes, and then we'll turn to Yoko-san. And then after that, we should have plenty of time for questions. Okay, so Nyoze-san, take it away. Okay, I guess I, I share my screen. You can share your screen if you want to just chat beforehand. Uh, I could just dive right into it. Okay. Um, I guess I'm, I'm uh, uh, deeply honored to be a part of this uh, lecture series and also to be asked to uh, give um, kind of my, my view of, of growing up um, in a Zen community. Um, th this uh, a first picture uh, that I picked was actually taken uh, by a son of a a Japanese priest who came uh, here and spent a uh, time with other children uh, from Japan in 2000, I think 2015. And he opened up, uh, he set down his iPhone overnight 
and uh, took this uh, picture of the sky. And I was thinking of, of the title that uh, was chosen for this, this, uh, 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 this program, Growing Up Zen, but I was thinking of Zen, of course, is, is uh, like the sky or like this picture that it cannot be, uh, it's something that's wordless and also something that is um, undefinable and also it doesn't have any beginning. Um, it doesn't have uh, any end and it, it reaches beyond uh, the edges of the universe. So that's, that's uh, the first picture. So this is the night sky on Sonoma Mountain. Can you, let's see, I think I need to. So this is a, uh, uh, kind of describes or gives a little flavor of the environment um, that I grew up in. And I have uh, three older brothers. And I guess <clears throat> we uh, were in Mill Valley. I was only like two years old in Mill Valley in 1971. And of course, uh, you see on the, the right-hand side, uh, that's a picture of our family on Sonoma Mountain. Um, uh, my father, of course, had a vision uh, from Suzuki Roshi uh, to dedicate, uh, to found a place, um, a somewhere to actually share uh, the practice of Zazen with other people. So um, his determination was uh, very strong and and also is very strong. Uh, so we moved up uh, in 1972 or 1973 to Sonoma Mountain. And it was, I think it was quite hard and difficult for uh, my older brothers because they were taken out of middle school and also high school during that time. So actually my older brothers uh, sacrificed a lot and it was, it was a, a very difficult time. And also, also during that time, in 1977, in Sonoma, Zen, or actually around the United States, Zen was was not known. It was, uh, you know, known by very few people. So um, that's kind of um, to the left is, uh, of course, the first attempt to found Genjoji in 1972. So this was a little beyond Santa Rosa in, in Calistoga. And uh, th these questions kind of, um, a caution help, help write these questions and then we kind of put them to the pictures. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a it's a pretty deep question. And even for me to talk about this, is, it's a very intimate, I think, thing to kind of, for me to express. Um, so Zen priest, I think, I think like I, I was saying the, the previous pictures, my, my father had, you know, it's not, not like a, a Zen priest, but I would say it's my, my father uh, had a very strong determination and kind of a vision and, and he, um, I, I guess it's, you know, it's been difficult for the family because I think that there was many um, things that the family or that the, the kids sacrificed, maybe not sacrificed, but went through in order to, uh, in order to, in order for my, my father's vision to actually come to life. You know, so moving again, moving to the Sonoma Mountain from a Mill Valley in 1972 was was quite hard. Um, so it, it, there, there's many many views and many many mountains and valleys uh, of having having a father as as a Zen priest. Um, Some, some is difficult, but then 
all of it, all of it is, is very rich. So even now, uh, it, even now it's, it's, uh, It, it, it kind of has to do with I, it internally. It, it's um, me stepping forward as my own person and also um, my father also letting go. So there is, there is, a, there, there is a, a, an interesting dance between um, my, my father and I. So it, it's a, not an easy one, but it's a very, I could say it's a very rich one. So this, uh, yeah, the, the relationship with the many people that came through Sonoma Mountains and community. Um, that's an interesting one because, because when, when I grew up, of course, we had, we had our family up. It's kind of up the road from the Zen Center, but it's all part of the Zen Center. Um, but at, at the same time, uh, when we were uh, playing around the Zen Center or would go down uh, to the Zen Center or when people would be working at the Zen Center, a lot of times um, I would help them, uh, interact with them or socialize with them. Um, there would be times when when I was, uh, I would be working, actually doing a uh, university papers or actually high school papers uh, in the office at the Zen Center. And, and then uh, students at the Zen Center would actually uh, talk to me about my, uh, my projects that are writing. So there was a lot of, um, you would say, input from the Zen Center on, on an every, kind of on an everyday basis. And at the same time, so the, the idea of family for me, uh, uh, of course, I had, there was a blood family, okay, so that's my, of course, my father, mother, and then my, my brothers, but at the same time, then the community, there, there was a bigger family that uh, allowed me to see different parts of myself, and also view different things, uh, view things in many different views, so, so it was, uh, it, it, it's kind of, it, it, it's, uh, so yeah, yeah, the, the fam, the family is, is a bigger, maybe a bigger sense of family. So being a kid on the mountain back in uh, 1974, there was, there was a lot of kids and it was, it was quite kind of a magical time. So uh, there was anywhere from maybe 20 to 25 people that lived here at the time, but it was quite wild. And so uh, my father, at that time, he didn't, he didn't set up a schedule or anything, but he, he started sitting. And for many years, uh, most of the community, they, they wouldn't sit, they, they wouldn't sit, but he would end up uh, sitting, sitting on his own. So he, he believed uh, that, that the community would, would grow kind of on its own through, through just the practice with Zazen. And, and definitely during that time, then all these kids came up in which uh, at that time, like I was saying, there was probably maybe anywhere from maybe seven to to 13 kids that would come every week for Saturday program, you know, and then uh, we would basically kind of terrorize, <laughs> terrorize and run around the Zen Center. And actually, we had a lot of fun. So uh, we, we shared, you know, what we're going through the week or at school or, you know, uh, so it, it was def definitely like ha having uh, many brothers or sisters, brothers and sisters. So being a kid on the mountain at that time w was very, uh, it was very impressionable to me and, and actually a very positive, very positive experience. And actually 
just two days ago, um, I'm, re I'm trying to re-roof uh, the Kanzan house where Kaushan and I live. We're, we're trying to put a new roof on it. And uh, this car came by and uh, this younger woman, she took a picture outside outside the window of the car and was driving off. And I, I said, hey, you know, come back. I, I asked uh, the woman, like, who are you? And 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 she said, "Oh, my father used to live in in that house." And I I, I asked, uh, "So who is your father?" And, and she said, "Paul Cummings." And so Paul Cummings, uh, a a kid who I lived with uh, back in the '80s, he lived in the house. And so they pulled over, and he got out of the car, and then we we talked. And I haven't seen Paul since you know 1987. So and he said. Uh, the Zen Center for his family and also his brother, because they were adopted uh, from Peru, uh, was actually a turning point for them when they they stayed at the Zen Center. So that that was uh, quite auspicious that they came by to see the other day. Uh, so back in 1978. Um, I remember I, I came home from, from school and one of my brothers, uh, asked me, oh yeah, you know, you know, dad, he wants to, to see you down his, down in his studio. And so, uh, I, uh, usually he, he, he didn't see, he wouldn't see us during, during work time. And, uh, I was a little, a little bit kind of hesitant to go down, but I went down there and then he asked uh, if I wanted to come along with my older brother. My older brother is, is on, I guess, the left side, all the way to the left. That's uh, Ryuk and my oldest brother. And so me and him went to Rinzuin uh, for my father's uh, transmission ceremony. And I think it was a very special time because uh, when we moved to Sonoma Mountain, uh, Zen, Zen, also my father dressing in robes uh, with a bald head. Um, it was almost, it was seen kind of like as a cult. So, so uh, it was very difficult uh, to, to actually tell others what, what the community is or what, what Zen is. Uh, so, Maybe as a, as a child, I felt a little bit um, uh, a little bit ashamed, you know, living at the Zen Center, and also a little bit um, and not part of of normal normal society. But I knew that there was something that there was very deep, and it was very true, and uh, something that was very pure about it, and it, and it was very good. But when I went to a Rinzo and, and experienced the same feeling at Rinzoen, it was a positive feeling. Then I started to see that uh, Sonoma Mountain or the community that I lived in was bigger than, than, what, uh, than, than what I thought. So this is uh, a Hoitsu Suzuki. This is me. This is my mother, a Shinko. And then this, this is Shingo. Oh, Huitsu Suzuki Roshi's son, and then that's that's my brother Ryokin. But this was a uh, in a very cold time. I think it was snowing, snowing back then. So we stayed at Rinzoen for a month. Um, I think that. Uh, The, the the stay the stay w was was something that uh, I I have kept for many years uh, in in my heart and um, and and I think I think it was through mostly actually through a contact and positive uh, a, a positive time with actually the the children and, and so I I made. Uh, contact and, and we're still in contact and that's you know 1978 all the way up to the present day 
I, I talk to them and also have seen them many times. They have come over to Genjoji. So um, this is, can you guys see my cursor? Yeah? Okay. So this is Narumi, uh, daughter of Hoitsu Suzuki. And then this is Kayoko. And then this is Shingo. So I was very close uh, with Narumi. Uh, I was eight years old and she was nine years old. And when, um, after my, my father's transmission ceremony, you know, we had to go and I didn't, I didn't want to leave actually Rinzoen or I didn't want to leave Japan. So it was a very, it was a very uh, uh, deep, I think, experience for me. So it was kind of, it was kind of like coming home um, uh, because, uh, because it, it, it gave me, it gave me the first time that um, that there was other people that would accept me of who I am. So during, during that time, like I couldn't express myself as, as, a, as a person being, being in a Zen community or having a Zen family. But when I when I went to Rinzoen, they were they were um, there were people that I didn't know. But then it was it was a family that that just ex, it, it felt accept, accepted. I felt accepted, and and then it felt the same as Genjoji. So so again, then I realized that there's something that's that's there's something that's deeper. And, and wider than just uh, experiencing just the Zen community on the mountain. So, um, so the mount, the mountain life, the mountain life and outer world uh, is a was a very was a very uh, it was difficult, but it was very interesting because. Because as children, or or uh, we had to switch back and forth uh, from from the mountain to actually the outer world, which was actually mostly um, going to school, also being being with uh, you would say the conventional world. So um, uh, it it was uh, quite interesting because I remember. I had friends that uh, I would go to their house, and I also I would really enjoy uh, going to their house. Their their mother would, you know, uh, we would get off the 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 bus, and they would they would have sandwiches ready for us, and you know, cookies and everything. And then we would we would play together, and they were in Cub Scouts. The father would would play basketball with them, and and. Uh, I, I did question that, like, why, why can, can my father, can't my father do that, you know? So, so I felt a part of myself, I felt like I missed out, missed out on, on that part. So as a, as a child, that's what I reflected or what, what I was thinking. But at the same time, then I knew, then I knew that there was something that there was, uh, something that was deeper and then my fam uh, my 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 friends would then come up to the zen center and they would enjoy they would enjoy it at the zen center and we would we would go down to the zen center and they would do orioki because we would we want to get food before we would go out or <laughs> so so it was uh yeah it, it was it it was uh it gave me a very a, a very good perspective you know, being on the mountain and then the outer world. So I, I think for me, the mountain or, or Zen and, and the conventional world or normal world, it's, it's both the same. It's both the same. So it's not like the Zen center is somewhere different, but it, it is actually the normal conventional world and it is the Zen center. You know, the valley is the same as the mountain. So as a child, I, I was 
I was able and growing up with that, we switched back and forth a lot. And actually for my father, of course, he was trying to found the Zen Center, Zen Center but um, he, he probably had, I don't know, had maybe less difficulty because we were, we were kind of bridges between both worlds. Uh, this yeah this is a this is a picture of me in in front of the arzendo in the the redwood grove and uh my my father or my mother never ever said anything about that we had to practice or sit zazen or uh be a buddhist um So we, we I grew up uh, very free, very free in that way. And my, my father never said anything about um, you should do this or be this way or, you know, he, he, he let me do and choose whatever, whatever I wanted to do. Um, so it was, it was never something, it was never forced, forced upon me. But as I grew older, then I, I start to, to understand uh, that they, they chose, my parents and my father chose uh, a path uh, that's, that was quite, quite different. And then that's, that's why we lived a certain way. So as a child, I didn't understand why everything was like it didn't work or, you know, volunteer had to patch the window that someone else broke or <laughs> so it was uh yeah 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 coming coming to zen on my own so i guess through through going to university when i went to uc santa cruz then i started to see names uh, pop up in my environmental studies courses and also my anthropology courses uh, that I met at the Zen Center. And so I started to get this bigger kind of vision of, of all kind of all the teachers and how, who, they, who they are. So, um, of course, in 19, 1993, uh, when I was on my own, I was working in the Bay Area. I started to sit on my own. And of course I started to sit because my life was very difficult. So I wanted it to be better. So then I started sitting. <laughs> um, but, then, but then I started to read the books that, are, that I, I grew up with, all the books that were around the house. So I knew, I knew all the, the teachers by names and uh, coming up to the house, they were, they were like aunts and uncles you know, that, that I knew. Um, and, and I think then, then uh, it, that, that kind of carved out kind of my own direction for, uh, for Zen practice of following it on my own. Uh, role models, of course, when, when I were, when I was young were, were all the, the, the teachers that came through Snow Mount Zen Center. And um, uh, like I was saying in, in the previous, previous picture, uh, coming in contact uh, with these teachers, we, th they would come up to the house and, and uh, eat, a, eat a meal with my father and mother and with the family. And, you know, we would, uh, you know, talk and, and then they would come in my room and they would like uh, play with me for a little bit and, you know, make calligraphy. And, and so again, then as I grew older, then all these teachers, I started placing them into actually kind of a lineage. It was a lineage chart, which is, it's a, this is a, the Buddha family or it's a big, bigger family. Um, Noidi Roshi in the center of this picture, he was the supervisor, or he's, he helped supervise uh, my father's uh, transmission ceremony from Hoitsa Suzuki at Rinzuin. 
And I remember as a child um, cleaning the, the hondo, like everybody was like cleaning fearless, fiercely, like just like cleaning the, 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 the temple, like sparkling clean. And it was, it was not out of fear, but it was for respect for him to arrive. So, of course, as a little kid, I was just following everybody. And I remember opening up the shoji screen of, of the, the Hondo. And when he got out of the car, then, you know, I slammed the screen because I was afraid that he would see me, but afraid that he would see me, but uh, see through me. Somebody, somebody who is great can see, can see all parts of, parts of you. So it wasn't, I wasn't afraid of, of him, but I was af afraid of his, um, uh, afraid of his uh, immovableness or his greatness, you, you, you know, that, that he can see. So these qualities that I experienced through many teachers uh, as a child, when I come in contact with it, it, it uh, inspired me and that was my true role models definitely and then that also I, I wanted to know and as I grew up I want to know what what that is like what is it what is that quality within these these teachers th that I met that was so deep and so authentic and so real so uh this is a oh, what advice for parents. I, I think I, I I think I kind of said it said it all. Is that is that um, yeah? I mean, I I would tell tell the parents, you know, let 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 your kids find out kind of on on their own. But then, you know, as as a parent, I think I've I've failed a thousand times. You know of not maybe doing the right thing or, um, but I, I try my best to, to be, uh, um, uh, <laughs> that, that's an interesting one. <laughs> I, I tr try my best to, to be a good example, you know, and, and also, also let, uh, Ajo, who's who's my kid, and he's he's fourteen now. He will be fifteen. I tried to give him a lot of space, and and to find to find also find his own way. It was not necessarily Zen, but to find his own his own way, his own true way. So, um, as parents or or. Uh, as the qualities of Zen, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I would, I would force anything, you know, force anything on, on my children and say they should do this or be a certain way. So I think, I think that's, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that that's, uh, all I have, all I have to say. I wonder, yeah, yeah, that, that's my, my last picture, but and maybe there's uh, questions and answers uh, after that, that uh, Yoko and, and I can answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nose. Maybe can you, there you go, stop sharing the screen. And then, um, yes, we'll have questions for, for Nose after uh, Yoko-san speaks. So Yoko-san, take it away. Hello, uh, my name is Yoko Okamura. Um, thanks so much for having me. I, um, I'm gonna mostly show a movie that I made. I'm a filmmaker out in Los Angeles. Uh, I made a 12 minute documentary about my dad and my brother mostly. Um, and you know, it's a movie that I made almost eight years ago. Um, so it's actually, but uh, even before you know, I finished, it was probably a movie that I took about seven years to make. So um, yeah, and just for a little bit of context, uh, I was born in Japan. Um, you know, we, uh, my first, the first home that I had was a Zen center and um, was a temple in Sonobe. 
And then we moved to Minneapolis because my dad was teaching at the Minnesota Zen Center. Um, and, you know, I didn't, you know, my, for me, my Buddhism was just like where my home environment was. It just was always was that it was very much normalized and like, you know, and a dad being a monk was the only thing I knew. Um, and I only knew it was different and not the norm once I start to, you know, become older and meet other people's parents and realize that that is not the norm. Um, but yeah, I'll just show this movie. It's again, 12 minutes long. Um, hopefully if you've already seen it, um, you can enjoy it for a second time. But um, yeah, after I show it, I can speak a little bit more about the process of the making of the movie. Um, yeah, so let me uh, share the screen. There are three important points to practice Tazen. One is posture, we sit upright and cross-legged. Second is breathing through our nose, uh, abdominally as if the air goes in through our nose and reach the stomach. Third point is letting off thought. I was ordained in December 1970, so at the time I was 22. The sewing practice, I mean, it, it is like a zazen. The stitch is called kakushi, and then the tiny, tiny, like the poppy seed size um, stitch. Each stitch we recite, I take refuge in Buddha, in your mind. When we married, she was 25, and I was 35. She was kind of a strange or unusual, you know, young woman as a, as a Japanese, who are interested in Buddhism. It's a kind of strange person. <laughs> uh, beginning of the Meiji period, a Meiji government said they don't support Buddhism. And at that time, Buddhist monks or priests uh, started to have family. No, I've never practiced Zazen. We don't really talk about Buddhism. We moved to Indiana when our, our dad finally had, you know, built a temple here, which he could, you know, run for himself. And I had a hard time adjusting to it, I guess. He started to go to a public school, but he didn't like it, so he quit. Since then, that means he was 12 or 13 here by himself without much contact with people outside. There's many people over 30 and 40 even that live, live with their parents. Their parents are aging, but their parents still serving their kids food and, you know, driving <laughs> I don't want him like that. When I started cooking, I guess just uh, got the, our mom's influence, I guess. I noticed that um, Masaki had a potential of being good cook. Cooking and Zen practice is important. We have special text called Tenzo Kyokun. They um, talk about how you treat the ingredients, vegetables, anything green, as precious as your eyes. I'm thinking about doing cooking professionally. I mean, kind of, I'm looking, looking at stuff in the courses in college right now. I think the next semester starts in August, few weeks from now, so I'm not going to make it 
till then, but yeah, maybe I can start next spring. Want to sign up for school? Uh, eventually. Why not now? <laughs> Lazy. What if I talk? What if I walk you through it? What do you walk me through it? I'll help you sign up. Bloomington, new freshman. Ivy Tech's educational kitchen enables us to train you for entry level positions. The goal is to send you into the food service industry equipped with manual. Theoretical and technical competence. Yay. I applied. Let's go visit the campus. Uh, I don't feel like it. And, uh, uh, I just don't want to go. What if I called and asked? Uh, no. Hi, um, is this admissions? Hi, I had a question. Um, are you open right now for campus tours? I don't want to go yet. No, I don't want to go. I guess. I suppose I'm afraid to, but it's just, nah. not ready yet. I say I want to do culinary stuff, yeah, but I just kind of frozen at that. I'm, Sure, like after I go to college, what do I do then? Do you feel any expectations for your parents? I, not really, no. Sometimes I felt like there's, I could use a little expectation. That I understand. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> They're sometimes maybe too lax. <laughs> maybe we, they can push us a little bit. We kind of want something. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give us anything. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, life would be easier and I'd be less lazy if they just wanted me to do something. Exactly. I, I don't know what to do. What the hell am I supposed to do? Like, you don't tell me anything. I, just, I guess it's just part of the whole like dis, disconnected like, the fact that we don't communicate. Okumura family used to be merchant in Osaka for six generations. To become a Buddhist monk is a kind of a too much for my parents. So when I became a monk, they were not so happy. And yet, I know I decided to be a Buddhist monk against their wish because I wanted. So I wish my children can live in the same way. To love is to give us space to grow. I think that is true. It's hard for two quiet people to have a, a communicate communication using language but somehow we can communicate without within quietness within silence i think oh, i hope that is what is called in buddhism heart to heart transmission <laughs> As far as we do something, because of my 
expectation or desire to get some result, we are not there. We are looking for something better. In Buddhism, that is called sansara, uh, life based on our desire. That means they are not satisfied this moment. They feel something lacking. Precisely because of such a situation, I think this practice and this teaching is really important and meaningful in this modern world. That is kind of a question to me about Masaki also. I really kind of admire him. He doesn't have such a strong desire about money or material things. But sooner or later, he needs to become independent to meet back in the world. Somehow we need to find out to live in the world, in this society, and yet find some peacefulness within there. Birds need to fly in order to figure out what the sky is like, and fish need to swim in order to find what the ocean is like and we human beings need to do something in order to find what this world is like. This thing is important, but we cannot sit 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so we have to do something. So we need to do this, sit, sleep, walk. Unless we human beings start to work, we cannot find any meaning in our life. Just live. Like a bird just flies and fish just swim, just live. Thank you for watching. Um, so yeah, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, especially when you're just starting out, I think you're always encouraged to make stories about what is a unique, something unique in your own life that's accessible. And, um, you know, having Buddhism as a part of my family and having my dad be Buddhist monk has always kind of been this thing that made me different. Um, and, you know, I think the takeaway from this movie is probably that parenting is a thankless job and that it's hard no matter what. Because, you know, I think what my dad says about the heart to heart transmission and like, you know, parenting kind of in silence. From my experience, I can say that it worked for me. Like, I, and I think what you can see from my, my brother, he had some challenges with it. But, you know, I've, I've always been somebody who is incredibly driven you know I was very young when I knew that I loved filmmaking I loved having a camera in my hand from like a very young age so I always felt you know just supported by my parents to do whatever I wanted and I think that was kind of the philosophy of parenting that you know um but again so but but you can see that for different siblings the same approach can have wildly different effects um and you know that's the thing is again like if my parents had pushed harder on my brother he probably would have hated it so again it's a thankless job where <laughs> you can take all these different methods and still you know come away with different results so um but you know i, I can't really speak for my brother i you know making a documentary of somebody that you kind of seem like you're speaking for them but um you know as far as the actual experience of just growing up around zen all the time again because i did not you know I, i'm not a practitioner i i i, I was more passively just in that community um, as a kid. And um, all I can really say is speak my observations as a child really, because that's when the contrast was more prevalent and that's when I was the most integrated into it. And um, I just recall moving to Minnesota and like 
as a kid, the only re feeling I can really recall is the contrast between um, Japanese people who went to the Zen Center and then the American people who went to Zen Centers and how, again, as a five-year-old, I felt a very oh. distinct difference. Um, and I kind of felt like uh, the American people were treating my father like as like a very special creature. And I, as a, as a child, I was just like very like, what is happening? And I thought it was very strange. And um, I, uh, I was just like, he's just my dad. Like, I don't know why everyone's smiling all the time. And that was probably just a cultural thing. I just, Americans were just smiling all the time. And as a five-year-old, I thought it was weird. Um, but yeah, you know, I, again, like, I remember my brother when he was younger, like, was embarrassed of like my dad's shaved heads and stuff like he was a kid, you know, but I just I, I from my personal experience, I don't ever remember feeling embarrassed or out of sorts. Like I always thought having a Buddhist monk for a dad kind of made me special. And it, it still is. Yeah. The thing. Yeah. It still is the thing that like, even to this day, when people are like, so what was your life growing up like? And I was like, well, my dad's a Buddhist monk. And it's always a thing that just like makes me immediately interesting. So, you know, props to that. <laughs> That's a little gift that I got to walk away with. But um, but as far as the movie goes, um, you know, again, it was already eight years ago that we made this. And um, but yeah, it, it was I, I started filming my family when I was in college at CalArts, like back in 2007 or something. And I just was amassing a ton of footage as I went, just kind of, again, passively observing my family. And um, my mission was always to just kind of like represent, you know, especially growing up just in, in a very, you know, uh, essentially a very white uh, Minnesota community. Um, I think I, I was always met with the uh, stereotypes of what it means to be a Buddhist monk um, when it came to people asking about my dad. I, and I think I was I always wanted to humanize that because I think I was always like, oh, they must be very stern. They must be very strict. Like, oh, how do they really support you in the arts? And so I just wanted to show like what a normal person he is. And that was always kind of the mission from the very beginning. But um you know, the, uh, the brother, my, my brother becoming a character in that story really was more actually my cinematographer who just suggested it. Um, I th think when it's your own family, you're very averse to like looking at the conflict. But my, my cinematographer was like, well, you know, your dad has his life figured out. It seems like he seems like he's doing all right. Like there's really no conflict in that story. Like, so who's still having struggle? Who's having, who, ha who has a story that we can really tell in contrast to my dad? And my cinematographer really pointed out like, you know, your brother is the one who's, you know, kind of not hasn't found his path in life yet even though your dad found his path in life so early on in life and I myself again was also lucky to find my path very very early and never struggled to find what my purpose was um so yeah so that's so no, again this 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 version of the movie really came out you know shooting uh I think 2012 2013 2014 over the summers and Christmases and um yeah, as again, documentaries goes, you kind of build the story as it goes. And, um, you know, you just hope that you're not misrepresenting the people that you're making a movie about, especially if it's your family. Um, but, you know, I, I hope that it's a nice little like time capsule and a little gem. Cause again, like, it, you know, we are not those people, we're not the same people in that movie anymore, but uh, it is certainly was a version of us, um, you know, years ago and uh, we just keep getting older. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I'd love to take questions. I don't know if, if I don't know what the time is, but um, I'd love to open it up, and that's because that's, that's kind of what I have to say. Okay, great. Thank you, Yoko-san. Yeah. Um, as she said, let's open it up. Uh, we have a good thirty-five minutes for questions um, for either Nyose or for Yoko or both, um, and I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll get to ask the first question uh, since um, it's right on my mind. And I'm just, maybe it's, on, I hope it's on other people's minds too, but for, for Yoko-san, uh, what has been the response? It's been about six years, you said, or more, eight years since you put out this film. What has been the response and has anything surprised you or have you learned or grown from the response or your response to the response to this film? Um, I think, um, I think the overall response has been just very positive and I think people really relate to the, to, to the conflict of like, 
wanting space but also wanting structure from your family and as a and um I think what I really learned is that uh, these stories of parenting are, are universal, right? Like this has a specificity of being a, you know, a Buddhist family, a, a, a Japanese American family in the Midwest. It has that specificity, but at the end of the day, you know, the struggle to know what you want to do in, with your life, the, per, the finding purpose in your life and the struggle of, you know, wishing you had more, you know, again, like have been pushed more by your family or not pushed more. Like those are universal themes that anybody can connect to no matter what your upbringing is. So um, I think the, my, the response to this film has just reiterated that to me of, um, you know, again, like how, how storytelling no matter what, it's about specificity and universality at the same time. Great. And then the, the follow-up question for, for both of you is, and this is a constant theme that, that I have throughout the series, because Zen Shuji, you know, is a Japanese American temple. There's many people who come and have always come to Zen Shuji, but it's founded in a Japanese American tradition four or five generations, you know, hundred years of it. And so the Asian American theme is a very important part of this lecture series. And Yoko-san, you, you kind of hinted at cultural differences, maybe racial differences growing up um, in your environment in Minnesota and then coming from Japan as well and noticing the difference between the Japanese who come to the Zen Center and, and the, the white people who come. And Yose-san, we've had many conversations about being Asian American um, in a Zen community, either on Sonoma Mountain or in the larger yeah. community, in which you're really the only one, or one of very you and your brothers, maybe, yeah. are the only one. And it really struck me when you went to Japan, you know, how much you felt at home. And certainly it's because yeah. of the Zen community, but yeah. I'm wondering to what extent it's cultural and racial as well. So that's I mean, kind of a I'm, racial question I'm, for both uh, of you. By blood, of course, um, I'm Chinese. Both my parents are Chinese, so um, um, I'm not Japanese. <laughs> and, and then also I grew up, I grew up in California. So, I mean, I'm really actually Bay Area Californian, you know? So also at the, the Zen Center, um, we, uh, growing up, uh, definitely back in the seventies, there was a lot of discrimination, you know, but, but, uh, uh, there was a lot of discrimination, but then at the same time, all my friends uh, were Caucasian. And so that's what, what I kind of uh, saw, I saw myself as, as a Caucasian. So, and, and at the same time, uh, we, uh, as a family, we didn't discriminate whether the people are Caucasian, Black, or, I, I mean, at the Zen Center, everybody can practice. So it's not a matter of race or anything. Zen goes beyond gender. It goes beyond um, a color, race. So any, anybody can sit zazen. So it, it doesn't, it's not, you know, maybe an I issue, Asian American. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I, I haven't thought of that a lot, but that, that would be my kind of my response to that. Because, because I'm, I grew up in a community that, that was already, I mean, this is what I know, just like Yoko was saying, it's what she knew. So, so we didn't, I, I didn't discriminate on anybody that came into the community that was not Asian, <laughs> because that's just what I know. Everyone who comes in is, is part of my family. So it could be a cultural thing or, but you know, being raised in the Bay Area, also being in Sonoma at that time, like I said, it was very, uh, there was very, there wasn't any minorities here, but it was, it was being at a Zen center that was mostly different from me. You know, I, I guess also it was being Asian, but then it, it, there's many layers to this. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, um, my, I was born in Japan, my first language is Japanese, and then I was, you know, thrown into becoming a Midwesterner from three years old, from five years old to 18 years old, and then I moved to Los Angeles for film school, and I've been here for like 15 years now, and so 
my Asian American identity has um, had many phases of development, you know, like as an immigrant, you first go like, oh, well, this, especially go, coming into an all white school, you're like, well, I guess this is a country for white people and I'm different and that's the norm, right? And then, and I, you know, I went to Japanese school in Minneapolis, but, and I saw other Asian people there, but it was like, ja it was like Japanese and America was very separated. Um, and you know, coming to America because my dad was teaching at the Zen Center, like that was always kind of the purpose behind the move. So it was always kind of related to me kind of trying to understand these different worlds, especially because the first world, the first American world I was integrated into and saw was like the American Minnesota Zen Center. Um, and that was, my, that was like my first community of introduction to, again, like people who didn't look like me being around and being the dominant, right? Um, but then I go to college and you know california there's way more way more uh, prevalent asian american communities and I, I i don't think i really had like asian american friends until i moved to went to cal arts um mm -hmm. so again like who i was evolved over time in my life um and it uh, definitely just like Zen was, uh, the zen community was my introduction when i was five years old um to america but um I'd also say that now, if I really look at it, how that, what's cool, I think, again, as I get to know different kinds of Japanese American, Asians Americans in Los Angeles, um, you know, it's a really cool way to connect to, to people, even if they're like Yonsei and their whole family has been here for like four generations as compared to me, who's an immigrant, but they also grew up in with the, you know, with the rituals and with the ceremonies and that I also similarly did just with a different language, but the same aesthetic and the same, you know, motions. And like, it's, it's, I thought, I thought it was really cool that I, I can, again, like we actually, you know, same lineage, different cultural, actual backgrounds. And yeah, we have all these things that we have in common that we, you know, again, can connect across. So that was my, that's been my experience. So let me remind uh, the audience, if you want to raise your hand, there's a feature on Zoom where you can raise your hand and I'll be able to see you that way very easily. Otherwise, you can put a question or a comment in the chat. Um, or this, I hesitate to say this because if everyone does it, it will be a kind of mess. But I think if one or two of you do it, just unmute yourself. I think you can and give us your question. So I'm going to read a question from the chat for both of you. That's similar to what Yoko just addressed or both of you just addressed. This is from Nikos. Uh, question for both. Talk a bit about how growing up in a Zen family impacted your identity as an Asian American, including how you've been perceived by other Asian Americans. <laughs> I Well, so for me, I mean, I think I, I really addressed the first part of this just now, but as far as like how I've been perceived by other Asian Americans, I mean, again, whenever I say that my dad's a monk, everyone's like, wow, that's so cool. And like, it just really becomes like a talking point. And um, I think people are really fascinated by it. And um, again, then the, the the normalization is activated in me whenever that comes up. And um, it, it's, uh, it, again, it, it, it becomes a top, it becomes, you know, again, perception by other Asian Americans, it, 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 it becomes a conversation of, you know, the differences and the similarities and um, are just a really way to bond, I think. Let me follow up on that, Yoko. Go ahead. So you've never had an encounter where people didn't say, or people thought, oh, that's really not just weird, but maybe sacrilegious or, you know, some fundamentalist Christian who might be very offended or put off by your Buddhism. Not by other Asian Americans. Um, I, you know what? Not not even by Caucasian. No, no, nobody has ever been like, "Oh gosh, like what is that?" Um, no, it's always more like a cool fascination. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, I've I've had that. I, I've I've had that, but I think it was just because of the uh, society didn't know know much, you know, about Zen when I was growing up, but as I grew older, also in high school, and then uh, told my friends, and then the word Zen kind of started to come into, you would say, the conventional world, you know, Zen nails, Zen dental, 
it gets more cooler and cooler and cooler. So when you do say that, like, oh, Zen community, like now, today, even, they're all like, oh, great, you know, meditation, mindfulness. But even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was like, you say Zen, and it's just, the conversation kind of stops, <laughs> you know, but, but now, you know, now just like what Yoko was saying, it's, it's something that's kind of on everybody's radar. And I, I mean, I think even when I went to high school, but also it was, I think with the, with the friends that I hung out with was more kind of a, uh, a little alternative or wanted to see a different perspective than the normal, normal societal view. So they would, they would ask what the Zen center is. And when they came up, they they uh they had a good feeling about uh, the quality of something is happening at the Zen Center that that they know is good. So then that's that was their impression of it, and also still the impression of when they come up here even even now. So I have friends that come back and they 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 say you know good conversations with my father or the people that were here, you you know. Which is, as, which is, I think as, as yeah. accepting, it's an acceptance, Zen overall, um, Zen overall, Soto Zen overall, there's an acceptance of who you are, of, of anybody who shows up that you are, you are a human being and a worthy also human being as you are, no matter whether you're different gender, transgender, you know, whatever, black or white, you're accepted. And so I think that's that's the um, the deepest part that that uh, yeah to to this question is is that it's beyond uh, beyond color form and shape and size and it reaches far beyond like I was saying. Okay, more questions from the chat. Two for you, uh, Yoko. One from Dorothy Wong. Did your brother find his purpose or vocation? So what happens to your brother? Um, and from Karen uh, Mueller, what's your relationship, Yoko, with Zen and with Buddhism now? Um, so my brother, uh, yeah, he went to Japan. Uh, he, 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 you know, left the nest and he went to Japan for three years, two years to, um, to a vocational school where he learned cooking. Um, he's back in Indiana with my parents now and he cooks for the Zen Center sometimes. Um, and helps out. Um, so he did find, you know, again, we're so different. Like I, I, you know, I literally haven't been home. <laughs> and like, I, I've been doing this in California for so long, you know, he went back home and like, he's been, you know, kind of, I think struggling still to kind of find exactly how to apply the vocation, but he still loves cooking and he's still, you know, that that's still part of him very much so. So, um, and he's really good at it. I didn't get the cooking gene. My, my, my mom and my brother are really good cooks and, uh, I guess that's not meant to be for me. Um, but, and uh, what's my relationship with Zen and Buddhism now? Um, my relationship with Zen and Buddhism now is the same it's always been, which is a quiet, passive appreciation for it. I call myself a lifestyle Buddhist because I was raised by two, you know, dedicated Buddhists. Um, have I read any of the books? No, um, but I, I'm sure later in life, I will, because that's kind of seems to be what always happens, right? Is that everybody kind of finds those moments in life when you struggle and you kind of go back to the things that were kind of always foundationally around you and like ready to teach you, but you weren't really interested or ready for it yet. Um, yeah, and you know, but it's, but it's always influenced because it's a huge part of how I grew up and just again, even just the environment in which I grew up, like it always seems to aesthetically or 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 philosophically influence the art that I make the films that I write like um it's always just like a little special thing that I can offer that's authentic to me um so yeah I um yeah like it was actively a part of my art making as far as like I literally made documentaries about it earlier but now it's just kind of like more you know naturally a part of me that sometimes shows up in my work um yeah Quick follow up just for me, uh, Yoko, and maybe for Nyoze san as well. Um, have other spiritual traditions or religious traditions, have you been interested in those as, uh, as well? I guess this is specifically for Yoko, but it actually could be for Nyoze as well. 
for me, I, you know, maybe it's also, I've never known if this is because I grew up with Buddhism or, or I just an inherent part of me, but like, I've always, you know, I have really close friends who are always looking for the answer. Like, what's the truth? Like, which religion is true? Which one's correct? Which one's right? What am I supposed to do with my life in order to do it properly? And I've always kind of just had this like sense of peace in myself that like, I can't know those things and I'm okay with how everything is. And like the world is order and chaos simultaneously. And I just, I've never been one that needed those answers. I've always been kind of the person who's felt like I are, the answer was I can't know. And that's the humbling truth. And to just live in that ambiguity is okay with me. And so, you know, for me, I, I haven't, pursued like other theologies or understanding them I, I certainly am fascinated by them in an you know sociological perspective and a, and a place for a lot of conflict and stories in um our contemporary world but as far as like my own personal you know religious or spiritual needs I haven't um and I, again I, I just think I've always kind of and maybe it's because of my parents or not I'm not sure what the source but I've always felt very comfortable with the world and um never actively sought answers yes yeah, so i i think when i was when i was growing up of course all all the teachers that i met made a, a big impression on me and but uh as i became a teenager i totally rejected it you know and i don't i don't want to believe in it so my father he uh, offered a jukai uh, uh, to me and I rejected it and uh, he, he said uh, why don't you why don't you want a juke and I said well because I, I should I should choose choose my own you know but he, he said this is the the greatest thing that I could give could could give you so I rejected it for for uh, maybe like four or five years and then during those years I you know looked into other other religions and other other ways of doing things because also my uh, people who I hung out were wanted to test you know and and I and I still do believe that uh, Zen or or to find your true way you should keep on testing who, who you are so it's not it's not even about being being Zen or being a Zen person but it, it's test test like who you are like as an authentic person of who you are test yourself and 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 uh uh yeah so it wasn't wasn't like being zen, zen or not or but that that would be my my i think a answer to that i don't know yoko if you're looking at the chat but you have a question from susie about the city of 10,000 Buddhas north of Santa Rosa, if you visited there in, San, in Northern California, she saw a version of your movie there. Uh, Susie, I have not visited. Um, I, yeah, I wonder, I wonder how you saw the movie. I mean, I, it did kind of make the rounds. Some people did some screenings and stuff, um, but I have not personally in person physically been there. And it's freely available on YouTube, right? Uh, on, yeah, on YouTube and Vimeo, it's uploaded, yeah. yeah. It's, um, and then Tony has a question for both of you. Uh, what is your favorite poem, piece of film, painting, or work of literature? My favorite movie is called Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which is a glam rock alternative musical from the early 2000s. It's nothing to do with Buddhism, but it is about make, uh, finding a way to be whole, so philosophically perhaps relevant but yeah that's my favorite movie right now for me nothing actually nothing comes to mind <laughs> I don't know um, <laughs> there's another question from Nikos uh, about both of you for both of you to talk about your relationship with nature and the natural world including appreciation for seasonal changes I'm not sure how to answer it in the context of this current conversation, but I I would say I'm learning to allow it to be a source of healing rather than a source of annoyance. 
it's I'm I grew up in Minnesota I really love weather um and but California can be kind of like brutally brutally sunny all the time and it's like it's having it's almost like having one emotion all the time and it's a little bit um oppressive so I'm trying to appreciate it uh even because I, I I miss the seasonal changes because I think that's humbling you know the rain and feeling a little out of control but yeah the sun is a little intense for me so I'm trying to appreciate it instead of fight it Jose, do you have a response to the natural world? Um, well, I mean, I, I appreciate looking at the sky, you know, and appreciate the wind, looking at the mountains across the valley. And so that that's also when, when I'm present for it, but a lot of times I'm not present for it, so I can't see it, but that's the view. I, I want to go back to your, your film, Yoko, because I thought it was very revealing. You said your cinematographer kind of intervened and or at least encouraged you to focus on your brother. Um, um, and you, that wasn't your natural inclination uh, just because you wanted to not show the dirty laundry in your family. Is that it? Yeah. And I think it was you know, you, you just, it's very natural to not want to make people uncomfortable. Um, I think especially as maybe Japanese people, I don't know, but uh, it, and I, I just didn't, I didn't see it. You know, it's hard when you're in it to see it, when you're in the storm to see it. And he had the capacity to step out of it and, and like kind of have a little bit of a bird's eye view and be like, okay, as an outsider, I see that this is the narrative. And he was also the person who suggested that I should be in it rather than I should erase myself as a filmmaker and just be a passive observer of my own family. So it was certainly, you know, a very enlightening thing for him to, to suggest. And me putting myself in it was also, yeah, like a process to, again, like contextualize the entire actual family unit um, came a lot later. Did it change you at all to make that documentary? I mean, in terms of your family dynamic, your brother dynamic, your, how you see yourself and your family? Well, I think, um, I mean, I certainly learned a lot. Like, uh, it's amazing, you know, how people need a reason to talk sometimes. Like, I just, there's so much about my parents I would never have asked or learned if this movie, if I didn't make this movie. Um, never, ever, ever, ever. Like, they, you know, they would never initiate telling me about this stuff and I would never have asked if there wasn't the, the sole purpose of making a movie and telling a story. Um, so I think putting a camera between you two can be a really, um, you know, uh, evocative purpose that people sometimes need. Um, I, I don't know how it's changed me in the sense that like, I, I, I don't know who else I would be with having not had it, but um, I, I definitely know that there's just a lot of stories that I never would have heard. Uh, you know, the whole, but what, what are some of those, remind us, what are some of those stories that really came out? Oh, I mean, I never would have asked my dad how he feels about my brother, like, and parenting him. Like, I never, like, I never, ever, ever would have asked that. Like, that just, uh, no, like, that just it makes me deeply uncomfortable. I would never have asked that, <laughs> um, except for this purpose. And, um, yeah, I, you know, the whole, uh, to love is to, to leave room to grow. Like I never, there would have been no context in which we would have talked about that over dinner, you know, maybe, <laughs> if, maybe if one of us was dying, we would have talked about it, but like, not to be morbid, but truly those kind of conversations don't happen unless it's like, well, this is it. Um, so yeah. And you know, that, that was a, and that little piece of what he said was actually a part of a bit larger story about where our names came from and that didn't end up in the movie, but like, yeah, just stories like that um, never would have asked the questions. It would, I don't know if your father is still on. It would great be great to hear from Okamura sensei about his response to the film. He probably ran away. Maybe you and he can have a conversation right now about it. Oh my gosh, please no. <laughs> <laughs> He's still there. Is he still here? Or? Yes. Oh, there he is. Uh, Okamura Sensei, do you have any comments about what your daughter was just about her film or about what she was just talking about? Nope. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> he doesn't want to say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. 
They ask you. <laughs> This is, this is it. This is correct. This is exactly what. Is exactly <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Maybe a Mrs. Okamura has something to share. Oh my gosh. Well, I really appreciate Yoko for making <laughs> this movie. <laughs> I mean, there's always like, a, I don't know, the movie's one thing, you know, sorry. And then there's all, always like an after story, right? And that's larger in a sense, but uh, we're, we're not here to talk about it. But uh, for the movie, thank you, Yoko, again. Yes. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, so it's, that's, so it's great to hear that your movie had a positive impact or that was meaningful. I mean, I, I always do wonder. I mean, my brother never told me what he thought of it. So I, I don't, I don't, did, was it positive? I don't know. They'll probably never tell me if it wasn't. Yeah, you need to ask him. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't need to. <laughs> yeah, no. He, he, he uh, I, we don't need to. He will not. There's nothing my dad will say about this beyond that. <laughs> I, I, I think a nice way to end would be to bring Kojima Sensei back into this question about parenting because you started us all off by talking about how in Japan, being uh, the son of Zen parents or Zen father is so normal for priests, right? But in America, it's not so, it's sort of unusual. And you are a father in America, you're a son in Japan. Do you have any thoughts about this whole, everything that was said or? Yeah, big difference uh, Japan and here. Uh, the Buddhism itself is a major in Japan. And other priests uh, born in the temple and raised by the, uh, the priests' uh, parents, that is a major uh, popular in Japan too. So that's a very opposite. And uh, there is a many words uh, mentioned about uh, expectation from the, uh, the parents. Uh, that is a very big uh, stress to the other uh, kids to grow up, especially the uh, first son or first kids, feel like I uh, have to uh, inherit or take over their father's position later on. That's a very stress. So there is many uh, struggle for that. And from the viewpoint, from the, the kids, I can say many things, but as a parent, uh, it's really hard to say something for that. Mm. Uh, I, let me show uh, share uh, one picture that's here. Can you see it? That was me uh, when I was uh, four years old. They already put me into the uh, priesthood. No choice. Uh, Notice I mentioned that the fuse that's taking the uh, jukai but we didn't have a choice before we can think about what is right, what, what is good for me or something like that, logically. Uh, we were in there. That's a Japanese way to you know, force it to do it. That was a difference too. And very different than, of course, you know, yose sans situation where he had complete choice and same with Yoko, right? There was no force or in fact, you made you stress that there was no force at all in your even becoming Buddhist, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that, I, I think it's an interesting thing. Uh, during during the movie, uh, Yoko, uh, there was no expectation, like no expectation, and that was kind of an interesting one because uh, some of my brothers we have talked about that because my parents like anything could happen, and we're all like. Like my friends, their their father, their mother would say, hey, you should do this. You should do that. You should do this. They wouldn't say anything. So we had to be motivated on our own. But sometimes it would help for a little motivation. But it turned out OK. I mean, just like what Yoko was saying, it, tur it, it, it depends on the person who is being motivated or not motivated. And who, who knows whether being motivated, you do actually get to do the thing that you want. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, generation has been changed 
and uh, used to there was no choice, especially for a first son. I would, I am a second son, so I had a choice. So that's make me feel better. Then I was thinking I really doesn't want to be a monk when I was kids. But actually, I choose that uh, this way for becoming a monk. So that makes me very uh, comfortable to being a monk. Then uh, that's a um, big difference to have a choice or not. So that's why, uh, as like uh, Okumura Roshi he mentioned, that want to uh, give children the freedom of choice of your way to live. That's I'd like to give it to my children and not stress, give the stress to choice, uh, have to be a monk or something like, like that, their choice. I'd like to put importance for that other parents. That's the kind of generation changes. Okay, we have one last question and this is for Nyoze from Tony. Um, he wanted to know what was the process like when you began sitting Zazen in the Bay Area uh, as an adult? Did it feel like coming home on the cushion or was it more gradual to get to that place? Well, I mean, I, I, I started because I, I wanted to solve something and feel better. I, I don't think it, I ever get to that place, whatever it is. <laughs> you know, it, it's a, uh, yeah, coming home. I don't even know about that. Sit, sitting, it's it's an end, a endless practice that's also bottomless. It's a bottomless practice. But of course, when <clears throat> when I was sitting <clears throat> on my own, it was something to solve something. And then my father, he he would ask me. Uh, I would tell my father, "Oh, I, I'm sitting zazen." He said, "Oh, your life." Uh, is it difficult or not? I said, I'm, it's difficult now, so I'm sitting more zazen. And then I would come back to him and say, oh, now I'm not sitting zazen because I don't need it because my life is not difficult. And he didn't say, he wouldn't say anything. <laughs> and then the, 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 the last comment in, in the chat uh, uh, is from Dana Takagi, who reminds all of us that most people who sit or come to Zen centers don't, they come from an, either a different faith or they from, come from a convert community or a former convert community. So this mm -hmm. kind of talk is, is quite exceptional to talk about Buddhist families and Buddhist parenting. I, I don't know if Dana has a question behind that comment, um, but we're, we're just out of time. So maybe we can save that for next time. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kojima-sensei to conclude us. Um, thank you, Nyode san Thank you, Yoko san It was thank a very uh, good uh, conversation with together. And uh, yeah. this is a very uh, interesting uh, topic for myself too. Yeah. Okay, everyone, uh, next lecture will be uh, September 17th. The uh, August, uh, August. Uh, Oh, sorry, August 20th, uh, Buddhism, Asian American, and U.S. race relation. So uh, please see you in, in August. Thank you very much for your participation. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye